Today on Hey Culligan, cleaner, safer drinking water. We got Chris in Cleveland. Hey Culligan, I have a water pitcher. Is that safe? Uh, basic water pitchers are, let's say, passable, but a Culligan reverse osmosis system can do way more and help reduce lead, arsenic, something called pesticide runoff. Uh, hey Culligan? Yeah, Chris? I- I'll take one of those reverse... Uh, reverse uh, osmosis to get the most is out of your drinking water? Chris, we're already on the way. Let us help you out with a free in-home water test with a local Culligan water expert at Culligan.com. Lowe's Spring Fest is here. We've got $10 off gallon cans or $40 off five-gallon pails on select interior and exterior paints, stains, and coatings. And appliance special values plus free local delivery on appliances $3.96 or more in-store and online. Lowe's, home to any budget, home to any possibility. Offers valid through 414. Actual paint sizes are 116 to 640 fluid ounces. Exclusions apply. See Lowe's.com slash rebates for rebate terms and conditions. For appliances, restrictions and additional fees may apply. See Lowe's.com or store for details. U.S. only. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to our special Saturday Maxwell series. For the past three Saturdays, we've been discussing the Maxwell family, starting with Robert Maxwell, and we're going to work our way through the rest of the members of the family who were involved with Ghislaine Maxwell, with Robert Maxwell, and with some of the misdeeds, let us say, of the Maxwell clan. Today we have an article from The Guardian, and this article is from 2019. This article discusses um, Robert Maxwell's life a little bit more, and how his life of secrets, his life of working with spy agencies... And his life of general scumbaggery, well, how that all affected Ghislaine. So let's jump into this article from The Guardian, and let's see what they're talking about. The headline, The Murky Life and Death of Robert Maxwell, and How It Shaped His Daughter, Ghislaine. This article was authored by Caroline Davies. This article was published on the 22nd of August of 2019. At one time, everyone knew where to find Ghislaine Maxwell. The former aide-de-camp of the disgraced, now-deceased billionaire, co-conspirator, child, fellow child abuser, general all-around scuzzbag and bipedal serpent, now-deceased billionaire Jeffrey Epstein, was a fixture in Manhattan's most fashionable salons. Yeah, certainly was. Um, we know that there were several different... Uh, Salons that took care of uh, Epstein's people. Fakai is one of them. We have an article about that scumbag as well. Another, oh, I knew nothing. Maybe we should revisit him as well and talk a little bit more about his salon. In fact, you know what? We're going to add it to the stack. With an impressive list of contacts, including Prince Andrew and Chelsea Clinton, she was a regular at fundraisers, book launches, and society weddings. And we know that that was all part of it, right? That was all part of her maneuvering to try and get herself wedged into so-called polite society. So it would be another in for her and Jeffrey Epstein. Now, if you're collecting compromise on somebody or on people, what better place to do it than at the very top of the power structure? And how do you get there? Well, you exploit relationships with famous people who even the politicians are gushing over. And then you maneuver that relationship into something that benefits you. And that is exactly what Ghislaine Maxwell did, and she did it very efficiently. Now, she might be a scuzzball, she might be a two-legged serpent, but she was, she was very, 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 very slick putting this whole thing together and then letting it play out. And if you think that just happened overnight, like she woke up like this, you're wrong. She learned at the knee of her father, at the knee of old Bob Maxwell, Mr. Man of Mystery himself. We're talking about a guy that had connections to multiple spy agencies. Multiple. The last place anyone would have expected to see her was a Los Angeles shopping mall, 
where the 57-year-old was photographed in a burger joint last week, just days after Epstein's suicide, allegedly, in a New York jail, where he was being held on charges of sex trafficking underage girls. Well, we know that that photo now, with, with hindsight to guide us, we know that that photo was manipulated. We know that that photo definitely was messed around with, and it was probably not even real, right? It was something that was used to throw people off the scent, to make people think one thing when it's something else that's really going on, and I highly doubt that Ghislaine Maxwell was even in California. Amid some speculation as to whether the photograph may have been staged, and with mysteries still surrounding her whereabouts... One thing is undeniable. For the second time, Ghislaine's life has been turned upside down by the death of a controversial and powerful man. Yeah, I don't like the way that's framed. Sorry, Guardian. I don't like the way that's framed at all. Oh, poor Ghislaine. Let's not make her as a victim here. Her life is turned upside down. After living a life basically where she was born into purple, a life of absolute luxury and privilege that was squandered by her, her father, and her family, you think I'm going to feel sorry for old poor Ghislaine? Negative never going to happen. And I take umbrage with the way some of these um, authors, some of these authors of these articles frame things. It's like they're almost trying to subconsciously get you to feel bad for her. Zero chance that's going to happen. She should be eviscerated in these articles. It is almost 30 years since her father, the press baron, Robert Maxwell, fell to his death, allegedly, from his $15 million yacht, Lady Ghislaine, off the Canary Islands, age 68. Even now, there is talk of suicide or murder perhaps by Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service. You know, it's so easy to pin everything on Mossad, right? It seems like a lot of people love to do that. Oh, it's the Mossad. It has to be the Israeli intelligence. Oh, breaking news. As good as the Mossad is at what they do, and folks, they are good at it. They cannot hold the candle to their big brother. And that big brother is the CIA. The CIA is the most powerful, the most hands-on intelligence service that this world has ever seen. What do you think, JFK was just messing around when he was talking about the CIA? What, do you think he was just joking around, that was just for a good laugh? Not only are these the most powerful people in the world, the CIA, they're the scummiest, and they have no qualms about taking somebody out. You know, people will talk about all kinds of uh, reasons why JFK got whacked, who killed him, blah, 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 this, that, the other thing. And I don't know who killed him, right? I don't know who pulled the trigger or who set it in motion, but I will say this. I guarantee you it was facilitated by the CIA. And when I hear people talk about the Mossad this and the Mossad that, I just roll my eyes at this point. Now, don't get me wrong. The Mossad is right up there, top three, top four intelligence services. But they beat to the CIA's drum, just like the rest of the intelligence services around the world. He was a man who could not face face jail, of being shown to be a liar and a thief. And he very much knew that was coming, says Roy Greenslade, a former editor of one of Maxwell's newspapers. The Daily Mirror? So I am a suicide theorist. I believe Maxwell threw himself off. All right, look, there's a lot better ways to go than tossing yourself off a boat right outside of the Canary Islands. Now, what, did he just lay there until he drowned? There was no poison in his system, right? They did an autopsy. It came back inconclusive. So what, did he just float around in the water until he drowned? I don't buy any of that. Sorry, I don't buy it. I don't think he killed himself. There are plenty better ways to go than hopping off a boat in the middle of the ocean, okay? But Ken Lennox, then the Mirror's senior photographer who saw the publisher's uh, naked corpse shortly after it was pulled from the sea, is convinced it was an accident. Now, that's something that I can maybe get down with, an accident. Now... 
We know that he's, you know, 68 years old, a little bit of an older guy, up on the boat, walking around. Who the hell knows what could occur? That's totally way more believable than trying to get me to believe that he committed suicide by tossing himself off the boat and just bobbing around in the ocean until he tired out and drowned. He used to get up at night and pee over the stern of the ship. Everybody knew this, and he weighed about 22 stone at the time. The railings were wire, so... I think he lost his balance because he was very top-heavy, Lennox says. He was Teflon man. I don't think he committed suicide. And neither do I, right? I definitely don't think he committed suicide. I think that this is very plausible, what what Mr. Lennox is saying here in this article, though. He got up, went to go have a piss, tumbled over the side. Very possible. We see weird shit like that happen all the time. I mean, I have a friend whose father... Hardy guy, very, very hardy man, no health issues, nothing. Fell down the basement stairs and broke his neck. So, you know, these kind of accidents definitely do happen. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that he fell off the side of this boat. Suicide, though? Wrong. There's zero chance, in my opinion. There's only two options here. One, like Mr. Lennox is saying... Old boy was having himself a whiz and tumbled off the, uh, the edge of the boat, lost his balance, hit wave hit, whatever it may be. Or he was clipped. Those are the only two logical explanations, in my opinion. Bombastic, bullying, and with a deep, booming voice, Maxwell was an enormous figure in British national life. Sounds like somebody else we know, huh? Bombastic, booming voice, bullying... Yeah, sounds like somebody else we know. Apart from the Mirror Group newspapers and the New York Daily News, his many businesses included Oxford United and Derby County football clubs. And uh, Ghislaine had a nice little job working for Oxford, didn't she? Must have been nice. Now imagine, just imagine for a second, your pops owned all of this stuff. Two soccer squads newspapers all over the place, production companies, publishing houses. Don't you think that you would use this great power and this great privilege for good? I know that I would. I would set up all kinds of programs for disadvantaged youth to come to the soccer games, to come hang out with the players, all kinds of stuff like that. I'd be donating money hand over fist. I mean, who needs billions of dollars? Let's be real. But these people, now they have better ideas. They're going to launder money. They're going to steal pensions. They're going to get involved with um, intelligence services and try and provide compromise. It makes me wonder if there's some inbreeding running around here in these parts with these people. Because this isn't normal behavior by normal folk. He rose from impoverishment as a Czechoslovakian refugee to become a decorated war hero, a businessman, a labor MP, and then a media mogul amassing private jets, helicopters, and Rolls Royces en route. So again, illustrating that these people had it all. They had the whole entire world by the balls. He didn't need to steal those pensions. He didn't need to get involved in any uh, 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 financial malfeasance. But greed took hold, and all of these people are afflicted by the same illness, folks, and that illness is greed. They're all Gordon Gecko. His death on November 5th, 1991, shocked the country. Shock turned to anger within weeks, when a 460 million pound hole was discovered in the pension funds of his companies. Now, imagine that. 460 million pounds. What are we talking roughly? I don't know, $700 million? Stolen from the pension funds. And this is where it gets interesting. Was Jeffrey Epstein involved in hiding that money and washing it and laundering it? I think he was, folks. And I think that the evidence that's going to be coming out is going to prove that. Now, we have a lot of circumstantial evidence that directs us in that direction. But once this trial gets underway and we start to see all of the, the stuff that has really been hidden from discovery, I think it's going to be very apparent that Robert Maxwell most certainly was working with Jeffrey Epstein, at least in some regard. 
A borrower of unimaginable scale, he had illegally raided the funds to prop up his empire, which was on the brink of collapse. Headlines such as The Man Who Saved the Mirror were swiftly replaced by Maxwell the Robber. Always funny when you turn from Robin Hood into the Sheriff of Nottingham Forest, huh? And that is definitely what happened with Maxwell. And these people, they do it so well, right? They have this public image that is bolstered by the media, that the media helps them prop up. And then when, it, when we find out that these people are scumbags, molesters, rapists, whatever it may be, the media acts like, well, we knew all along. We told you. What do you mean we weren't doing our job? As they're sitting there and breaking bread with these scumbags. Lennox found himself at the heart of this drama when he was dispatched to help Maxwell's widow, Betty, as she flew by private jet to the Canary Islands. On takeoff, her husband was still missing. Mid-flight, Lennox recalls, he was summoned to the cockpit by the co-pilot. A body had been found in the Atlantic by a fisherman. The Spanish were unsure it was Maxwell. Would Lennox agree to look first to spare his widow unnecessary distress in case it was not her husband? And look, as much as I hate the Maxwells, as much as I hate Robert Maxwell and Ghislaine and the whole family, I can understand how, you know, something like this could be disturbing. And uh, Betty, Miss Maxwell, is lucky that Lennox was around to do this, right? Who the hell wants to identify their husband? Then again, maybe Betty Maxwell hated him. Maybe he was such a monster and an ogre that the whole family hated him secretly and they only suffered him because of all of the money he had. They landed at an airbase and Lennox was ushered into a room. And there was Maxwell, completely naked, lying on top of the Air Sea Rescue Officer's mess table with a sheet underneath him. And I know it sounds crazy, but he looked good. His hair still slicked back his complexion, he looked as if he was still alive. Apart from a graze to his left shoulder, Maxwell's body was unmarked, Lennox says. So, that's interesting, right? Okay, it's unmarked. Did they check it for little needle marks? Because that is one of the preferred methods of poisoning people when it comes to the intelligence services. A little needle prick of some, uh, some sort and some kind of concoction shot into your bloodstream and before you know it, you're in big trouble. So, I really wonder how thorough the autopsies were. My guess, not that thorough. He signed an affidavit that it was indeed the publisher. Then they asked me to come over and stand by Maxwell. There he was, laid out horizontally in front of me. I held up the affidavit and they took a photograph of me with Robert underneath. So, somewhere in the Spanish archives, there is a photograph of me with Maxwell's corpse. Well, that's kind of, like, interesting. I wonder if there's a way to access those photos. Is there a Freedom of Information Act type of uh, situation in Spain? I have no idea. So anybody out there listening, I know I have listeners in Spain for sure. Hit me up with an email and let me know what the deal is with that because I'd like to uh, get a, a look at that picture. The rumor started immediately. An inquest that later recorded death by heart attack and accidental drowning, although three pathologists disagreed on the exact cause of death, has failed to quell them. Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like Jeffrey Epstein? All sorts of dissenting opinion, all sorts of shadowy questions. And how come, inevitably, it always happens with people like this? When you or I die, they're going to, you know, perform an, an autopsy or whatever, and they'll be like, oh, yep, here's the cause of death. But with Epstein, Maxwell, they can never pinpoint it, right? They never have an idea of what went on. Oh, oh, throw their hands up in the air. We don't know what happened here. It must be natural causes. Meanwhile, there are a mountain of questions that have still not been answered. People were phoning me up with all the conspiracy theories. Do you think Maxwell was knocked off? Did you see any puncture marks behind his ears? But he was unmarked, apart from that graze on his shoulder, says Lennox. And while Mr. Lennox is probably telling the truth to the best of his knowledge, to the best of his memory, I highly doubt Lennox himself did a full check of Robert Maxwell um, head to toe looking for needle marks, etc. 
Betty, completely controlled, would later, later formally identify her husband. Shortly afterwards, Ghislaine flew in. She was really, really upset. You could tell this was daddy's girl. She was inconsolable. She could hardly speak. When she saw her mother, her knees just buckled, Lennox recalls. She was really devastated. If you look through the Maxwell files, he would take her to events. Elton John's birthday, football matches. She was always there clinging on to him. She called him my daddy all the time. And again, that's why I say and why I'm so adamant about my analogy of her and uh, Robert Maxwell paired with Cersei Lannister and Tywin Lannister. Very, very similar story here. Very, very similar character arch. The fallout from Maxwell's death left his family's reputation in tatters. It also landed two of his sons, Ian and Kevin, in the dock, where they successfully defended themselves in 1996 against fraud charges arising from their roles in his companies. Now, we're going to dig in more about the brothers and the rest of the family as well. We're going to branch off here. But this is going, we're going to continue talking about Robert Maxwell until we get the full profile built, right? Another, uh, another one or two Saturdays, and we'll have the full Maxwell, Robert Maxwell profile built, and we'll move on. But I think it's very important that we add as much context as we possibly can as to who the patriarch was of the Maxwell family. To understand what is going on now, we have to understand what occurred then. Kevin became Britain's biggest bankrupt to the tune of more than 400 million pounds in the wake of the pension scandal. His then wife, Pandora, mother to their seven children, claimed a colorful, colorful cameo on the day of Kevin's arrest. On hearing an early morning knock to, at, the journal, at, at the door and presuming it to be journalists, she flung open a bedroom window and yelled, Piss off or I'll call the police! We are the police, came the reply. That was priceless, says Lennox, who was among the journalists tipped off to witness the arrest. You know, I take umbrage with that, by the way, with the journalists who are tipped off to witness arrests. Let's let's relax on all of that shit, okay? Except for the, the most high-profile arrests, I don't really care for that. If we're going to do it for one person, let's do it for everybody. You, the, the, the media shouldn't pick and choose who a pariah is. The media should report the facts. The trial of Robert Maxwell, or the trials of Robert Maxwell, had he come back and faced the music, would have been a piece of amazing theater. Way up there with Bernie Madoff, says Greenslade, the author of Maxwell, The Rise and Fall of Robert Maxwell and His Empire. Absolutely, right up there with that. This, is, this was a huge, huge operation of thievery and scumbaggery. Maxwell was stealing all kinds of money, folks. And we're talking about from middle class, hardworking people, pensioners. That really bothers me. Because... I feel kinship with the middle class, the whole middle class, lower, middle, middle class, and upper middle class. Those are my people. Once you get above upper middle class, it's like a foreign race of folk for me. And I know that because I have associated with them professionally and personally for a very long time. Ian and Kevin, like all the Maxwell children, were regularly bullied by a father who thought nothing of humiliating them in public, although Ghislaine, apparently, didn't get it quite as bad. I felt this was a proxy trial for Maxwell, says Greenslade, who attended every day of the brothers' eight-month trial and was pleased when they were acquitted. Now, I haven't dug enough into that, that trial to give an opinion on if I believe they should have been acquitted or not. As I'm going deeper into the Maxwell family here, I am certainly looking at that case as we speak, but there's a lot there and I want to make sure that I know what the hell I'm talking about before I dip my, I, I dip my toes in that water. For Oxford-educated Ghislaine, the youngest of his nine children, Maxwell's money had provided status and a ticket to the elite. She was dispatched to New York initially as a meter and greeter, to pave her father's way when he bought the Daily News. 
she was sent there to get things started with Epstein, to get that relationship kicked off. I don't care what anybody says. They were in contact and working together. Maxwell and Epstein knew each other from Epstein helping him with the pension thievery. And he thought that Epstein would be the perfect, perfect cover partner for his daughter. That is what I believe. And I believe that's where the evidence has led us. After his death, she made it her home. She soon became part of Epstein's inner circle and remained there for, for more than a decade. The two were reportedly briefly an item. They remained close. I don't believe they were an item at all. I don't briefly or otherwise. Cover story. Again, watch the show The Americans and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. She is said to have facilitated Epstein's social contacts, flying with him on his private jet and organizing dinners for influential people at his homes. One acquaintance describes her as half ex-girlfriend, half employee, half best friend and fixer. Epstein described her in a 2003 Vanity Fair profile as his best friend. And I'll describe her as co-conspirator, general all-around scuzzbag, fellow child abuser, and bipedal serpent. That is exactly what she was. Best friend, girlfriend, none of that. These people don't know what friendship is. And we're seeing that play out in front of us as they all start ratting on each other as the walls close in. After he pleaded guilty in 2008 to soliciting prostitution and served 13 months, it appears she moved on, although she remained on New York social circuit. She founded the nonprofit Terra Mar Project for the conservation of oceans in 2012, but it shut down abruptly last month. It is not clear how she supports herself. Oh, it's very clear how she supports herself. Using laundered money, ill-gotten gains, and many, many, many offshore accounts. And the Terra Mar Project, please. More of a scam, more of a lie, and more BS. She has never been accused of wrongdoing by the authorities. Oh, yes, she has. Allegation by Epstein's accusers that she helped procure, procure girls for the financier have been denied repeatedly. So we know now in 2021 that, well, she is being uh, accused of wrongdoing and a lot of wrongdoing at that and that she is in a world of trouble. Maxwell, one of seven children of Jewish parents, was born of Jan Ludwig Hoch in the Czechoslovakian mountain village of Slatinsk Doli, now part of Ukraine and known as Solot Dimivio. However, Solot Invio. He claimed not to have had a pair of shoes until he was seven. Man, these these uh, city names in Eastern Europe get me all kinds of tongue-tied. I'm lucky I could speak English, right? I hardly speak English as it is. I speak uh, broken uh, New York Italian English. So when they get these, these crazy names of some of these cities, I'm like, uh, what? He escaped Nazi occupation by fleeing to France as a teenager, but lost his parents, four siblings, and most of his extended family in the Holocaust. After joining the, Czech, the Czechoslovak army in exile, he was evacuated to Britain and joined the British army under the name Ivan du Maurier, apparently after a cigarette brand. Whoa, that's crafty, huh? I think I'm going to join the uh, military and you can call me Newport the Marlboro Man. That's going to be my military name, my nom de jour. He fought in Normandy, met his wife, a student at the Sorbonne, and won the military cross for heroism on the Dutch-German border. The decoration was pinned to his chest by Field Marshal Montgomery. And folks, you know, I always talk about gray characters, right? And how all of us really are gray characters. We're capable of incredible good, and we're incre uh, capable of incredible evil. And you see that with Robert Maxwell. Even though he was a decorated war hero, and he was... He was also still a piece of shit scumbag. Guess what? Absolutes are not good because you can be two things at once. That's why I think it's so ridiculous when you have segments of people who try and pin people, right? As one thing or the other because of one opinion. 
You could have an opinion that leans one way, but all of your other opinions fall to the other side of the spectrum. Just because you have one opinion that leans a a certain way doesn't make you a liberal or a conservative or, you know, it got to be more nuanced than that, folks. We got to get out of that paradigm. Enough with the ideology. Throughout his life, he was a good friend to Israel, investing heavy in publishing, pharmaceutical, and computer firms in the country. He met accusations he was an Israeli spy with furious denials and legal threats. Threats, threats, threats. Never actual legal action, though, because with legal action comes discovery. So always be wary of these people who threaten legal action, but don't go through with it. Such speculation was fanned again after his death, when he was accorded almost a state funeral in Israel, attended by Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir and the President Chaim Herzog, and buried in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. Conspiracy theorists have claimed that Mossad killed him because Israel refused him a loan and he threatened to retaliate. I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. Now, the Mossad might have whacked him, but I don't buy the reasoning there. And it is weird that he had such a huge honorific funeral in Israel, isn't it? Certainly goes to the argument that he was a important asset for the Israeli government, be it a spy, a facilitator, or whatever it was, the fact remains that everybody does not get this kind of funeral. Only people who are considered special by the government. Lennox was on the private jet that took Betty and her husband's body to Israel. The crew struggled to load the oversized casket into the small plane eventually having to prop it up at a 45-degree angle, in clear view of the passengers, he recalls. What is this, like one of those movies where Count Dracula gets his um, casket put on a plane, but they have to stand it up straight because there's no room? Here's an idea. Get a different plane. At one point, looking back, Betty remarked, Ken, what do you think? Is Robert standing on his head or his feet back there? And I said, well, Betty, he's always landed on his feet. And she just roared with laughter. Uh, okay. I, you know, again, I'm like, when people are grieving, sometimes their sense of humor and stuff is a little weird. So I'm not going to falter too much for that. But Betty Maxwell certainly does not seem like a, uh, a quality human. Maxwell certainly survived many scrapes. In 1971, a Department of Trade and Industry inquiry investigating a takeover bid at his publishing company, Pergamon press concluded that Maxwell was not, in our opinion, a person who can be relied on to exercise proper stewardship of a publicly quoted company. It would have been a damaging setback for many, but not for the man that Private Eye nicknamed the Bouncing Check. That's hilarious. Now that is a funny play on words, the Bouncing Check. Love it. Very crafty. As you all know, I'm a big fan of nicknames. After the war, having changed his name once more, Ian Robert Maxwell set about recreating the family he had lost. Of his and Betty's nine children, their firstborn Michael died age 23 after several years in a coma following a car crash, and a daughter, Corinne, died of leukemia age 3. Look, I don't wish that on nobody, okay? I don't care who the family is. It's just brutal to imagine a um, three-year-old girl dying of leukemia. You know, I'm very, uh, I have a soft spot for people with cancer, obviously, going through what Carrie and I went through, um, seeing some of my best friends, some of the people I care about the most, like Maria, it, it, cancer is something that I always have a ton of compassion for. And it's something that I would really, really love to raise some money to help in the research of at some point. You know, I plan on, uh, hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. And when I do that, the 2,600 miles, I definitely plan on on raising money for survivors of all sorts, cancer, sexual assault, and otherwise, because there are certain causes that really get your boy going. And, and helping people with cancer certainly is one of them. And if any of you out there have a significant other or a family member who is going through cancer and you need to reach out and speak to somebody, I'm, I'm here. Hit me up, email me, let's talk because I know exactly what it's like. 
every night to crawl into bed next to the person you love as as they lay there with a bald head, uh, you know, battling cancer. I know what it feels like. And I am a pretty reserved person, so I didn't really reach out to anybody. I just, you know, dealt with it on my own terms. But if anyone out there is dealing with something like that and you need somebody to talk to, hit me up. With the exception of Ghislaine, the surviving children led lives away from the cameras. Ian, 62, and Kevin, 60, have reportedly set up an organization similar to the Prince's Trust in Greece. I'd love to take a look at the laws over in Greece, the financial laws. I'm sure these guys are up to no good. Growing up, their home was the Oxford Mansion Headington Hill Hall, leased from Oxford City Council, which Maxwell described as the best council house in the country. But Sunday family lunches were very, very rarely happy affairs. He was said to ritually humiliate his children by turn, week in and week out. Man, that's so different from the Italian type of get-togethers I know. Now, don't get me wrong. Balls are certainly busted. But there is a feeling of absolute love and caring that permeates from everyone that's around that table. Especially when the food starts getting chomped on. I can't imagine sitting at, at Sunday dinner with the family all around and my dad humiliating me. I mean, breaking my balls, of course, right? Like, you know, when I got my ears pierced, for instance, when I was a, a much younger lad and I came home, he started breaking my chops calling me Barbara. So, you know, stuff like that. All right, I get it. But to humiliate your children? Come on, man. The only time my dad ever humiliated me is one time I changed a grade on a progress report, right? And my dad found out. So we're talking seventh grade here. So my dad dressed me up as a hippie, put on, you know, a vest, buttons, the whole nine. I, I, had, I had the whole ensemble on. And he made me go outside and play with my friends. That was my punishment. So I get it, right? I get, you know, punishment's one thing. And breaking balls is certainly acceptable. But to humiliate your children in front of people is absolutely ridiculous and something I am just not a fan of. Pandora, who reportedly refers to her former father-in-law as the fat fraudster, has spoken of the corporal punishment meted out to Kevin as a child. Greenslade witnessed Maxwell's public admonishment of Ian. In her autobiography, Betty, who died age 92 in 2013, described Maxwell as bullying, unfaithful, and frequently absent. But she insisted he was not the degenerate monster many said he was. I, I take umbrage with that word degenerate, by the way. Degenerate should be used for gamblers and stuff, right? Let's, let's save the degenerate word for the gamblers. Robert Maxwell was something completely different. Let's, let's label him as draconian. To understand Maxwell, says Julia Langdon, the political editor of The Mirror under him for five years, you have to think of him as multi-personality. He was the city magnate, the bully, the aspirant politician, the Jewish daddy. Langdon traveled the world with him and found him fascinating. He was very bombastic, very prone to flattery, very vain. My first reaction when he died was that I could not think of anyone less likely to commit suicide. I think he fell. So now that's two people very close to him that think he fell. I'm starting to lean that way as well. Old clumsy fat ass fat fraudster probably took a dive. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't still discuss the other options, right? Nothing is solid here. There's a lot of contradictions and a lot of opinions that go against each other. Greenslade also dismisses the murder theory. Having interviewed the captain and crew of the Lady Ghislaine in depth, he has concluded that no one could have got aboard on that fateful night. Well, what if it was one of the crew? Eh, you know, just saying. Again, I'm certainly not Sherlock Holmes, but you know. He does not have fond memories of his time with Maxwell from 1989 to early 1991. Their first meeting before he was hired was at a dinner at a London casino. He behaved atrociously, sweeping all the cutlery and crockery from the table, saying it was badly laid out. These are the people I hate the most in the world, folks. I've had colleagues that I've went out to dinner with who have utterly embarrassed me 
by the way they conducted themselves, how they talked down to people, how they treated the wait staff. And in one instance, a colleague from the financial sector behaved in such a way. And not only did I light him up right at the table, I made his wrongs right with the staff financially, even though the guy made about 50 times more money than me. It's all about principle, folks. It's all about doing what's right. And, you know, I'm somebody who doesn't obviously do what's right all the time, but I try to do what's right when I can. And treating wait staff and people who are there helping you and serving you in a, in a manner such as this is one thing that will launch me directly into orbit and make me stand up in a crowded room and call you out. He would sack people while Greenslade was away, play mind games, bully his staff. He used to urinate off the top of the mirror building and was known to leave the door open when using his office toilet. What a brute. What a disgusting brute. So yeah, let me take a whiz off the top of the building because that's a good idea. So gross. These people really think they own the world, folks. Well, guess what? The year 2020 was the year that the predator turned into the prey. And the year 2021 is the year that the narrative is snatched. Staff often witnessed him trying to impress important visitors by picking up the phone and growling, Get me the White House! Get me number 10! The switchboard would ring back three minutes later, and he would turn his back pretending he was involved in a conversation. Once Greenslade recalls, at a charity performance, Maxwell went on stage to lecture a prima ballerina on how to do a movement. That was the nature of the beast. What you have here is a kind of sociopathic, possibly borderline psychopathic character. Yes, yes, and yes. That's exactly what it was. This fat slob thinks he can get on stage and tell a ballerina what motion she she could be going through? Robert Maxwell was the sort of guy that most certainly needed to receive a few leg kicks in his life. He adds... Here was a man totally found out, not able to escape, and not able to bluster, and he would have been in the dock, but he might have taken some very interesting people down with him. In that respect, it's Shades of Epstein. There you have it, folks. More on Robert Maxwell, the fourth installment of our uh, Maxwell family investigation, and it's going to open up now into the other members of the family. So every Saturday from here on out until the whole story is told, we will be discussing the Maxwell family from Robert Maxwell on down until the story is told. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. If you'd like to find me on Twitter, you can do that at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. All right, folks, I will be back later on, and we will pick up where we left off. Now, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be back for a daily drop tonight, if there's some new news for sure. If not, there will be a couple of flashback episodes in its place. Also, remember, tomorrow, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, the live stream, cracking off once again. I hope to see all of you there. A link to that live live stream will be posted in the description box. All right, folks, please enjoy your Saturday. Come celebrate Lowe's first annual Spring Fest and give your lawn the look it deserves with five bags of premium mulch for $10 or three 19.3-ounce Bonnie vegetables and herbs for $9. Spring Fest, a festival of fun and savings for your garden and total home, in-store or online. Lowe's, home to any budget, home to any possibility. Offers valid through 421 while supplies last, in-store only. Selection varies by location, U.S. only, excluding Alaska and Hawaii. We can sum up McDonald's new crispy chicken sandwich in one word. Crispy, but also juicy and tender. Okay, it's crispy, juicy, tender, all one word. But then, also pickle. Oh, and potato bun, which is two words. 
Okay, we can't sum up our new crispy chicken sandwich in one word. So, you'll just have to try it to understand it. Order ahead on the McDonald's app at participating McDonald's. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.